March 23rd from the Central Board of Eight Education to Germany to the Kinch to the West. Thank you. Um, I have a motion to approve the agenda. Mr. Bracken, first, Mr. Hickey, second, all in favor, seven and all. Thank you. We're going to start off with uh, board recognition for winter athletes. That will be by Zoom and video. But as we all know, we, we, we usually love this when the students come in, and unfortunately, we still have to do it via Zoom. And again, the CEDO is uh, logging on right now. It looks like we have a new camera. Much clearer image of us, if we really want that. <laughs> Is there a filter that can do something about this here? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Great. <laughs> Um, so first of all, I would just like to thank you all for allowing me to attend virtually this evening. Um, I really look forward to when we can have our athletes back in front of everyone. Um, this winter season was unlike anything we've experienced before. Uh, so just to kind of recap the timeline quickly, and then we do have a video prepared to share with you to really kind of highlight um, all of the great things that our student athletes and coaches accomplished this year. Um, we started our winter season on December 8th for our boys and girls bowling and boys swimming and diving programs, um, really unsure of what would be in store for the rest of our winter athletes. On January 11th, we kicked off our indoor track season and were able to create a great experience for our student athletes in a very different way, utilizing our own resources um, and hosting our own high jump meets here for the first time sending our athletes to smaller venues like TSC and, and really being creative with how we offered that opportunity to our student athletes. Um, and then it wasn't until February 1st that our basketball, wrestling and hockey athletes were able to fully return. Uh, despite all of these changes and adjustments, our athletes and coaches made the most of the season and great, gave us some great memories that we'll share here with you in a couple of minutes. Um, in addition to these, the accomplishments that are highlighted in this video, I also wanted to share that our boys and girls bowling team did receive the Scholar Athlete Award. Um, unfortunately, because of the timing of how our other winter sports started, we don't have all of the results back for the rest of our winter sports, but I will be sure to share that with everyone once we have that information. Um, and again, I, I'd really just like to thank everyone that made the season possible for our student athletes, from our coaches to our transportation team, our facilities team, our building and district administration, our teachers and support staff, our technology team, um, our parents, and just our overall Ranger community. And of course, all of you are our board of education for your constant support of our athletic programs. Um, I can't thank you enough for the continued support and flexibility that you provide our athletic programs. And I hope that you enjoy our winter season recognition video.
Hi, I'm Jordan Scherf and I'm the captain of the girls varsity bowling team and this year we actually ended up winning the class B sectionals and it was the first time in history that a bowling team did that and it was a great opportunity and I had so much fun with my teammates this year and it felt so good to break all these records. And I'm also bowling in college this year, uh, well next year actually, so I'll be attending Columbia College and I got a bowling scholarship so I'll be bowling for their team. Hi, Coach Pitaro here of the Varsity Bowling Team. Our boys and girls had a great season this year. Our boys finished as the finalists in Class B, and our girls brought home the sectional championship. Um, it was a great year for both programs. Um, our girls team rose to the occasion. We were the third seed coming in, came from behind 150 pins to win it. Um, the girls got better, and so did the boys. It was a great season. Hi everybody, Dan Glover, varsity wrestling coach here. I wanted to congratulate the team on another successful season in spite of all of the challenges. This year we recorded our fifth consecutive Monroe County division title and our third section five championship in the last four years. On our way to these titles, we had individuals step up and perform outstanding. We had five individual sectional champions, um, another guy in the finals, in a number of place winners. Dominic Vinci was also named Monroe County Wrestler of the Year. I want to thank you for your continued support, especially the athletic department. Yeah, so um, this year was a lot of fun. I really didn't think we we're going to have a year this year, so I ended up doing traffic a little bit, but then wrestling came around and I was like, yeah, let's do it. Um, it was a crazy year. I mean, usually we have like up to like 20 matches. We only had like five, which is sad, but also it's it's the best we can get and I'm thankful for that. Um, we eventually went on to sectionals and we won for our whole team. We won class A2 champions and as an individual I won the 189 weight class for class A2. Um, it was a lot of fun even though that we didn't get a long season and some people would bomb, especially some of the seniors. We still got to spend some time before the end of wrestling.
So again, I, I just like to thank all of you for your continued support um, of our student athletes and our athletic programs. And it was a great winter season, uh, just reflecting on the highlights, I just smile. It was just a great experience for all of our athletes. So thank you again for all of your support. So Jen, we definitely miss having a room full of kids here, but we're looking forward to, to, to next season to uh, maybe we can have more people in, in the room here and join us. And hopefully, you. yes, hopefully, maybe after the fall two season or spring, we got two more. So lots of opportunities still. Okay. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. I miss having students here. You know? Oh, we have a young Nick Stone. Shut up. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm it out. Okay. Um, right, next item on our agenda is privilege of the floor. And first, I'd like to invite Mr. Michael Mayer. Good evening. My name is Mike Mayer. I live at 405 Whittier Road. Uh, telephone number is 721-1359. Okay. I have two issues today that I'm talking about. One, the first one, I'm here representing my wife, Wendy, my daughter and son-in-law, Keith and Lindsay Walls. We would like to recognize special ed teacher, Ms. Cohen, speech teacher, Mrs. Borelli, and their team at Burnaby Elementary School for the excellent job of teaching our grandson, Gabriel. We all had concerns regarding sending Gabriel to school this year. We really did. These concerns were quickly forgotten by the way Ms. Cohen and her teammate Gabriel loved. In the past seven and a half months, we've seen such growth in Gabriel. Every day he looks forward to going to school five days a week. He's in special ed. Notice I did say five days a week. It's because of her team effort that we would really like to recognize them because they have really made it special for my grandson. Please continue to recruit and select excellent teachers like those that are teaching Gabriel. The second issue is mine. All of us want five days a week for grades K through 12. What I want to speak about is grades six through 12. I hope that all conditions change for September to make this happen. But as we all know, goalposts change. I would like the board to request someone to look into the possibility of split sessions, grades six through 12 in September, if by chance things don't change, because two and a half years of two days a week doesn't work. Uh, I went through junior high school and we, our junior high burned down seven through nine when I was in school. So we went two years split session. I, I was young enough not to, to ask why the school burned down, okay? But it did, they had to rebuild it, and it worked. We did it because we had to go somewhere to get educated. I know Gates did it, they had trailers. I just think under the conditions, I know lately everything's been good news, things are moving towards five days a week. But I just think instead of waiting, maybe we could have somebody look into it. I don't know the financial cost, is it feasible? But I really don't think our kids can last kids six or 12, two days a week for another year. And who knows what's going to happen. So if by chance they change and it's five days a week, great. But I'd hate to see it come out somewhere in August and suddenly you can't do it. And we haven't been at least thinking about it. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I'll come back and you'll remember the, the, the gentle sounds that, that remind us of coming. Yes, hopefully I will know one five minutes. Sorry, we'll follow 16 Carolina Drive. I have two children in the district. Uh, first off, I'm excited to hear about the news uh, of four day uh, coming up in the near future here. Uh, it's uh, twice as much education as your children have had all year. I know you guys have worked hard to make that happen. 
a lot of moving parts there. Uh, I want to thank you all for your efforts uh, in making that happen. Uh, <clears throat> that said, uh, I'm an engineer and living in Rochester, I've come uh, to appreciate one of the great titans of uh, the manufacturing industry, George uh, Eastman, and some of the wisdom that he tried imparting on Rochester residents over the years. And uh, there's two quotes today that I think are uh, really relevant to what is going on right now. The first is, <clears throat> to rest content with the results achieved is the first sign of decay. Now his company uh, in its current condition withered to a shell of what it used to be is, is uh, you know, a proof of the prophecy basically that, uh, that he uh, uttered uh, in many, many decades ago. Um, and uh, the second is that the progress of the world depends almost entirely upon the education of its children. So four days is definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, however, I urge the board and uh, um, administration to not take their eyes off the goal. And the goal is to make sure that our children return to school full time and receive as complete and well-rounded an education as you can possibly provide to them. Um, my wife and I moved our family over to the west side um, and chose Spenceport specifically because of the excellence of the education and the program that you guys have had here for decades, really. Um, it, it is not a recent thing. Uh, it's been a, 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 a long time, excellent track record of education. And I know a lot of people in this room, uh, their wives, administrators, all of those people have gone into you know, making sure that that quality of education has been here. And I appreciate all your efforts to that end. But four days a week is still 80% of the way there. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, I, I just want to, I want to point out that almost six months ago, when we chose to go to the model that we chose, um, there were doctors and parents and medical professionals and studies and all kinds of evidence, even in August, that were pointing toward the fact that full-time education for children is the right thing. That children are not as susceptible to this virus as the elderly are. That there is no real benefit to choosing a part-time limited education in the pods that we are in. Now, I know we were under the state guidance uh, which uh, may or may not have been uh, um, as binding as you think it was, but um, this can never happen again. Damage is too great. I want to bring to your attention that New York State in the last COVID bill has received $12.9 billion in aid directly for school districts to cope with the COVID crisis. Uh, that's approximately $6,000 per student that you should be receiving. Now, I don't know the timeline of the distribution and all the details, and I'm not 100% sure that every district is gonna get the same amount. But keep that in mind when you guys are looking towards your plans for the future, because investment in things like UV lamps for the classrooms, enhanced air filtration, robotic cleaning machines, physical modifications to your buildings, so that you can make sure that you can get as many students in there as safely as possible, because this can't happen again. A year from now, when the next swine flu comes up or the next bad flu season or the next avian, whatever it is, we can't have our kids staying home. The damage has just been too great and we need to prepare for the future. And this money that hasn't been allocated to anything yet needs to make sure that we, we take a good hard look at how this money needs to be earmarked for making sure that what happened this year and what happened last spring never happens to our children again. It wasn't fair to them, and it will last decades, the damage that was done to them. So thank you for the time speaking to you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Susan Fowler, um, and I moved here just 18 months ago. 
specifically so my child could go to Spencer Court School. Um, I'm from the west side, but we had always heard really good things about Spencer Court, so I'm proud to be here today. Um, I never I never saw myself as an outspoken advocate by any means, um, but when it comes to my child's education, that is definitely worth advocating for. Um, I'm here today to advocate for a full five-day reopening. The pandemic is certainly something you know none of us could have planned for, uh, but it's how we respond to a crisis is what really matters. I certainly want to recognize the efforts of the administration, the teachers, the staff to make this year the best that it could be. And I know that the, the toll that this hybrid bow has had on my family, our emotions, and what my child is experiencing academically. Um, the asynchronous days are not an opportunity, um, as stated in the last Zoom. They're a day off with homework. This is not a learning opportunity for elementary students who need the most guidance and the most in-person instruction. I've heard some really great ideas from other parents that I hope have voiced their opinions to you, their ideas, and I hope you're listening. I had no idea how far behind our kids were academically until I recently spoke to a friend who had a child in the same grade as mine, but in a private school. When I mentioned what my child is currently learning in math, for example, her child had learned almost two months ago. Our kids need every moment that they can get in person with their teacher receiving the instruction they're entitled to. I have so many questions, um, and I'll certainly get them out to all of you, but hopefully these are already questions you're already considering. If the plan on April Pulse is still six feet of distancing, you know, I have so many questions that, you know, why weren't we doing this all year long? If we follow the three feet rule, it seems like we can fit more students in the classroom. So maybe that would free up some time for more teacher's assistance. Um, students receiving extra reading or math services. Um, if those teachers are told to teach other classes, you know, are those children gonna get any additional services? Um, without having to do, um, online instruction any longer. I'm hoping there's some planning time uh, now that the teachers might be free. Um, you know, I guess in brainstorming with, with other teachers that teach in other districts, it, it seems like, you know, if, if we can get one good plan together, if the teachers have one good plan together to at least kick off, um, could we then, you know, kind of plan as we go? Um, I hear a lot that, you know, when is there use for planning time and you know, I, I'm just hopeful over the next couple of weeks, maybe a good solid plan can be put together and then we continue to plan as we go along. So just some thoughts. Um, and again, I'm just here to advocate for five days a week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. privilege on the floor is that me? Good evening, everybody. My name is Scott Mead. I live at 28 Sarah Circle in Ogden. Um, I've got four girls in, uh, that are here in the district, two of them in Canal View, uh, one in preschool, and uh, the other is just getting her teeth as we speak. So uh, quite, quite the interesting family. Uh, I, I really wanted to spend time to make sure that the board and that the administration, the teachers, everybody understand the thanks, at least from my family, I know from the community, for the heroic effort you're pulling right now. And it is heroic to go from a request just about a month ago to how do we figure this out to get to four days to being able to implement it as quickly as we want. Uh, I, I've worked for a lot of tech companies, I've worked for a lot of startups, and we're always pleased with ourselves about how fast we move and how fast we innovate. And seeing the school do this beats most of those hands down. So thank you very much to everybody for supporting the teachers there. And I also want to thank the kids because the, the kids, the students, I have seen them wearing masks. Just this morning, my three-year-old reminded me to put on a mask as I walked through in preschool because I forgot. Um, they, they've been phenomenal. The reason that I'm here is to address two specific issues. One is communication. There has been a massive communication vacuum regarding schools, 
in this community. And it's toxic. It really is. If you talk to other parents, other families, there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt being spread around. And, and I, I think that you know, some of it, um, some of it is, is working with teachers, working with administrators, working with the board, emailing these you folks and, and at, you know, asking for responses and not getting it. We, we get crickets. And, uh, and that's very frustrating. I do want to thank you, Dr. Chisel. You have um, really, you've responded to emails. And I think that you coming in, I'm seeing a lot of traffic on the web. I'm seeing a lot of videos. Um, I have, in the last 10 years, I've cried five times. And they were at my four daughters' births and when you announced that we were going back on this report. So thank you for that. Um, when I see communications, uh, you know, that, that aren't being sent, that typically stems from mimicking behavior that comes from the top. And, and whether or not we've got teachers and administrators and staff members that aren't communicating clearly because they've explicitly been told not to do so or because they're following an example is a big concern for me. And so I really like to see the example, Dr. Kissel, that you've said, the communication with this community. I would like to see that from the rest of the group. Seeing communication, seeing openness, that's critical. Because that's the only way we get through this. It really is. This is this entire situation is toxic. It's unprecedented. And unprecedented times call for unprecedented actions. So please crank up the communication. Um, I have a quote from the website. Um, there was a set of FAQs, and the, the question was: why have some schools reopened in other parts of the state? The this is a direct copy and paste from a couple hours ago. The answer to this question is a combination of semantics, myth, enrollment, and facility differences. That is not an answer. That is spreading more fear, uncertainty, and doubt, a myth. It is not a myth that Pittsburgh right now has K through five, they have had since September, in the building five days a week. It's a four and a half day effort, but they are in the building five days a week and it has been that. That's not a myth. So there's a lack of specifics, is a lack of communication, is a huge problem, and it's toxic for this community. The second thing I want to talk about is leadership. Uh, as the elected leaders of our school community, it's your mandate to set the direction and advocate for this community. I think the big thing right now is we have an implementation team. Again, I'm a software engineer, so we have made the decision there's an implementation team doing the heavy lift right now to get kids in. I am challenging this board to think ahead, not just to five days, think to September. What happens in fall of 2021 when COVID-21 hits, when the next thing hits? That's what we need plans for. We need contingencies for, and we should be having committees to do that now. We have been behind the ball this entire time, and it has, we, we all know the emotions. We don't need to cover all of that. We've all been through it. But we need to start planning now, and we are behind. We need to get ahead, and that's what I need this board to do. That's what this community needs this board to do, is to get ahead. You have a huge team of incredible people behind you. It is your job to be the tip of the spear and to get us to that next level, to be planned so that we don't have to go through this again. Again, thank you very much, everybody, for your time. Please, please, please lead us to the resolution, we get us contingencies and make sure that when something else bad happens, we're able to get through it and get back. Thank you. Thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts. We'll be getting back to everyone within the, the, the next week or so. Thank you. Um, consent agenda. Uh, motion from uh, Mr. Reckon, seconded Mr. Maselli. All in favor? Seven all. Thank you. For the education reports, I, I, I have to say that uh, um, I've been Busy with my work life and my personal health, so I haven't been to too many committees or, or, or doing a lot outside um, in, in the district. 
Um, you, you did see an update about the or, or in the, or the consent agenda, the uh, the calendar. Um, that's something that, that I've been participating with, and that has been resolved or in our, our agenda. Uh, so that's it for me. I'll, I'll just start off really quick. Um, we had a safety committee meeting today, and I know um, I know Dave will probably speak on the code of conduct, but we're at that point in the year where the safety committee divides up into two subgroups. When we talk about the safe safety plan, which is school against violence and education, as well as the code of conduct. Um, I went to the safe safety plan, and basically we're starting to sit through the plan and take a look at the state mandate conclusions and expectations that need to be updated and put into that plan. Um, we're going to be working through that over the next couple of meetings. Um, and you'll be hearing more from Nelson Drake on that in May. And then obviously it'll come to us, I believe, our June first meeting. All right. So we're starting that process right now. That's it. Um, I have something that information about the safety plan. Board meeting. Um, the topic was um, around amending policies for COVID. Uh, our district did want to network at the beginning of the year when we amended the code of conduct to reflect our COVID policy. Um, one thing that was interesting that they did say was to their mind as we continue to um, amend policies, um, keep in mind the fact that some of this uh, remote learning may continue. Um, for example, if we wanted to continue remote learning for students who are unable to attend school due to a medical issue or something along those lines, that our policies may want to continue to reflect some of the behaviors and expectations for online learning in the event that the district does continue with those in the future. So that would be Just jumping in behind Mark. April 19th, we're going to have a all day seminar uh, policy and leadership during COVID. I think it's one of the county school board association I'm not sure who's put it on. I've been working with my campus very much for the time now working on some things like that. It's just really deals with the evolution of uh, policy and learning and remote learning. It's done more at a state level. It's like the kids that work down there, it's eight hours, eight hour chunk of all the same. But I'm going to try and get paid a bunch. Just two things, real quick. Uh, attended the rotary meeting uh, Monday. Um, at the report, they kind of did a uh, how we work a meeting type of meeting. Uh, trivia tables kind of used that report from them. Though. But I did attend earlier the um, code of conduct meeting with Mrs. Dinklage. And to make a very long story short, they're uh, thinking about um, changing the intent, the objective, the trajectory of the code of conduct, trying to make it more relevant to uh, addressing our inclusivity and health responsiveness. Um, moving forward. So uh, we kind of scratch the surface a little bit and they're going to kind of get a game plan down and maybe share with us sometime kind of where they want to go as far as, you know, moving forward. Uh, maybe looking at other districts, how they address certain things and compared to kind of some things might be stagnant in our code of conduct. Is it something going to be first, something going to be last? So uh, they're going to kind of get on their ducks in a row and come to us to give us kind of a standard view uh, for head nod and then they're going to move forward with the plan. We got the um, labor relations law. I don't think we are. Uh, Mike and I are both going to have to do it again because of other responsibilities and stuff. And then, uh, Jamie, are we still having a lot of meeting around here? Yeah. Seven minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't think we're going to have any more so, so uh, the scholarship is what what's almost trying to trigger some of the oh, um so, so if, if she changes on the scholarship committee, which is always a, a incitement committee to, to, to be on the to sit and, and, and read all the the letters, everything about that with the student chair uh, about the scholarship. So thank you for that. Okay, Dr. Kitzel. So at this time, we'd like to 
yes for your approval of the tenure recommendations that came to you last board meeting. A lot of times teachers are here, unfortunately, the circumstances are not. All right. Just want to say that all the teachers are going to be out there and doing things for all the hard work and uh, keep it up. Absolutely. Thank you for having that strength. You can inform and follow on for that. So, for the for the those listening in, um, it, it's the, the tender approval. And like Kate said, we've been in, informed on a regular basis about it. So it's not that we're just doing a, a rubber stamp here. Um, we, we've heard the progress and we appreciate everything that, that you all have done. And we are about to welcome you on the, uh, the tenure here. So I, I vote. So, so go ahead. I'm just going to share everyone's time. school district is a true milestone and accomplishment and Spenceport is known for its quality education. That's because of the quality teachers and you should be very proud and we're very proud of you uh, for earning that great accomplishment. I know you'll serve our students here for many years to come. So at this point, uh, we have some gentlemen that would like to talk to you a little bit about an update from the capital improvement project that began, I believe, 2018. Uh, yes. And I'll turn it over to Rick to do introductions. All right. Thanks, Dr. Kistel. So, again, uh, we have Kevin Rademacher from Labella, Joe, and Kevin from Campus, who are just going to share with you the process and, and why we have some, I wouldn't call it additional funds, but we've had savings within our capital project for a variety of reasons. We'll share with you that, the process that we use to determine uh, the two areas that we're sharing with you tonight for you to make a decision on is how to move forward uh, for a project that will occur in the summer of 2022. So, gentlemen. Thank you, Rick. That was a, quite a large introduction. <laughs> <laughs> so, hello, everyone. Hope you're all doing well this evening. Uh, as Rick said, I'm Joe from campus. I'm the PM or the project manager for the Capital Improvement Project. And over the course of this past year, we en encountered opportunities for savings in the capital project. And at this point, we'd like to move forward with awarding additional work to complete in this 1821 capital project. So as Rick mentioned, we got here from multiple opportunities. We have had three bids to date out of our expected one. All three bids have come in under budget. We have captured savings from our expected financing from your financial advisors. Over the course of the year, they have freed up more and more dollars. And at this point, we are comfortable awarding what they have freed up. And finally, in terms of unforeseen conditions from the project to date, they have been minuscule or minor in scope. 
and have allowed more dollars to be freed up from there. So any new work at this time will need to go back to SED. As I mentioned, we have gone through three bids. Those three bids exhausted all the available work we had approved from SED. So any new work at this time will go to SED for approval. And Campus Olabella are coming to you today with two potential scopes that we have identified that would fit, fit the needs of the district and the current project. So a quick budget overview. We're still working off the $12.385 million referendum. The incidental costs, when you take away the incidental costs and the uh, contracts awarded to date, leaves us with around $650,000 approximately to award for additional work. Of that additional work, there's two options. There's 14 classrooms, rent, the potential renovation of 14 classrooms in Dodger Middle School, the 100 wing. These have been previously considered on other capital projects, but have been cut for various reasons, but are available now. And then additional site improvements. This project has been very site heavy to begin with. This would be additional asphalt replacement of the Burnaby main park. Line. So a few photos. These are the existing Cosgrove 100 classrooms. The renovations would include the unit ventilator, uh, ceilings, lighting, painting the walls. The flooring was replaced in the last capital project, but every other item in the room would be renovated. And then the Burnaby parking lot is a couple of aerial shots of the, I would say, quite deteriorated pavement. In terms of a timeline, whichever choice we go with is the same. LaBella will design either scope in this spring. It will go to SED over the summer. We'll, we'll bid and award it in the fall and winter, and then construction will either be in the spring or summer of 2022. Does anyone have any questions? I do. <laughs> Sorry. So, being correct. Uh, so, um, all in all, there was a saving of like six hundred something thousand dollars. Is that right? All saving. So that's going to pay for this stuff here. What one of the other? Yeah, one, one of the, the other. Uh, uh, it, so it's dollars to Rick's point. I think earlier, it's all still under the same referendum right. budget. That was passed okay right so my question is uh do we have to spend that money if we don't does the money get given back to us i mean i, I just don't want to spend it because it's there you know we spend it because is it free money if we don't spend it what happens at 690. well so don't have to spend it. Okay. We've been authorized by the community to spend it. Right. Okay. Up to a certain amount. Up to the 12. Right. 12, 12 to sure, up yeah. to the 12. Three. Well, we right. came under because of all these right. things. Okay. So um, normally you want to try to maximize because you've been authorized to do right. that. Yeah. Plan uh, if you decided not to do that, right. okay, then we would borrow less. And right now, based on our um, financials and working with DPD, um, we were we're going to borrow up to the amount less that six hundred fifty thousand. Okay, um, so we would go out and um, our debt service and all that would potentially change our building aid because originally it was built on the twelve point three, so we wouldn't get as much aid. Of course, we wouldn't spend as much. Um, another, uh, I just want to interject one thing because I have some longevity here. So. If anyone that remembers, there was a task a facilities task force committee that helped develop this project several years ago. Um, these scopes are up here for a reason. They were studied at one point to be in this project. Um, and even at Cosgrove, the 200 wing has already been renovated. That was in the last couple of projects. So the 100 wing would kind of finish off those classroom spaces. The Burnaby parking lot was studied. It just of the existing conditions, even as bad as that looked, the other areas that have been renovated were even worse before it started. So the northwest corner of the Burnaby parking lot is flat out. It's, it, it's, it's yeah, this it's past big. winter did it no justice again. So yeah. it's it's at its lifespan. Yeah. But I, I just I want to make the point they were part of the original concept at one point, just priority and budget didn't allow. Yeah, I just I don't see a reason for not doing a lot of it. I mean, we already went through what happens when we don't address 
you know, payment. Yeah. Here in New York. Um, I'm torn over the paving because it's, it's going to be gone after another one. Uh, the shop. Um, classroom, I mean, I'm not, I'd have to do a little while. Oh, I, I, toured, I toured classroom this year mm -hmm. and I was actually horrified by the 100 called classrooms because they look identical to when I was there <laughs> a year ago. So uh, they probably look identical yeah. to when you were there and it's horrifying. And that, and that probably so is But I will say that I'm before Lori that talked about the design building mm -hmm. year after year after year. Um, I know the painting does need to be done, but they are starting to run out of options as far as fixing those that, you know, like they're harder to get parts, they're done. It's not available anymore, and it's going to become a huge issue if we don't address that. So, well, honestly, the kids don't need to follow the way in the classroom exactly. and the worship department. All I'm comfortable with other board decide that. Personally, I'm looking to improve student instruction yeah. areas yep. for a parking lot as much as I would love to say let's do that parking lot for other reasons. My priority is student instruction area, yeah. Yeah. hands down. That's just my opinion. Okay, so we want to do it. So just just one more question, kind of uh, like Dave's for the, for the the money piece. When that goes out for bid, are we feeling that it's going to be under that six fifty, or what if it's over? There's, so what we've estimated on a concept and we're predicting the market conditions when it bids this fall. Okay. So um, we obviously take pride in our estimates and hope it's either on or just a little bit under. Yeah, yeah, we trust everything. But we, we have there is the there is some contingency available if there's a small overage okay. that the project can handle. Okay. So and we'll probably plan so that we're not in this position again. Mm -hmm. We'll plan to probably over design it a little bit. To build some alternates so that if we are under, we've already got permit from SED to award a little bit extra work. And we'll also carve out a couple protecting alternates so that if numbers do spike, um, we'll still have a successful award. We'll just lose a little bit of the renovations. Okay. So all you have to be determined, we didn't make any decisions on that yet, but we'll package it so the district's protected. Okay. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks for all your view. It's been uh, just because we're here, we haven't been here in a few months. Um, the rest of the work, is there any questions on the rest of the work? We've kind of been on a shutdown per se, but um, the closeout process for the work completed in the fall is you know, pretty well through. Um, I don't, when do we remold and clear up some of the early, <clears throat> or late spring? Late much. spring, the school, as soon as school ends, we're full board again with more, with the rest of the delivery. So we've kind of been in a holding pattern. The two projects that we did out, We've been doing the startup with executing the contracts and the insurance and the bonds and all that stuff. So they're ready to go in the spring when it when it breaks free. Okay. So it's been a good run. We're happy to be here. Thank you. Okay. Then if you can stick around for our next conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so next conversation, our policy says that any change order over twenty thousand dollars requires board approval. Uh, Joe wrote the memo. And that's what we're looking to do. Or again, just as a quick update, it's um, doing additional paving in the, uh, on the west side of the uh, parking lot, the back where the buses are, and then a little grassy section. Take that out um, and make that all asphalt. Joe, is there anything else you want to? It's essentially running the asphalt to the fence line instead of leaving five to eight feet of grass for the bus drivers. So it provides a little bit of safety component to give you more walking room. It also makes sense to do it via change order with the contractor that's begin, going to be doing the rest of the work as opposed to alternate procurements. You want to order the same contractor that's doing the rest of that parking lot. So are, are they already doing that parking lot? Is that their yeah, the, yeah, yeah, this yeah. would just be extending. It extends the limits asphalt. out further, getting you a little more asphalt. Okay. So, so I, I brought up a question earlier today with um, in the outline. It, um, Really didn't emphasize one of the big reasons for with safety. Some bus drivers aren't walking in the traffic line. So, so we want to make sure that we understand that this is not just to have 
um, the more lawnmowers in that area. It's, it's a safety thing uh, among others. It definitely enhances the safety and then just by accident takes care of some of the maintenance needs too. Yeah. I'm sorry, what's the safety? Yeah, just gives safe. more more walking room around the buses and things like for the inspection. Yeah. <laughs> like the 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 they don't have to walk um, where they had to driven to park in parking spot. For right. They are able to walk outside the parking lot to get to the bus garage. I see. And walking in front of buses or walking yeah. behind them. I gotta look at safety. That's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Is there eight? Second, Mike. All in favor? No? I'm sorry. I don't. I don't. No. 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 Sorry. Okay. Why can't I say? Well, I was telling you, I don't, I don't think it's something I want to approve. Well, I guess I was saying is that I'm not buying the no fence. Anybody here in the room, I'm not buying safety today. No offense to the bus driver, but as to spend thirty more thousand to take care of some rent, I just. So well, it, it, and that's why I, I brought it up that the way it was written, the way it yeah. showed up, and you know, right. it just sound like. Hey, we're, we're saving some lawn to, to, to mow. Right, that's um, right. And I looked at it, and, and that was my first concern. Right. Why are we spending money to not mow grass? Um, but but then when, when I looked into it further, um, that the, the idea is now one of them is that the um, bus drivers are not walking through yeah. the driving path. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Okay. So Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of the night. Thanks, guys. At this point, we have uh, made some comments relative to our reopening plans and then uh, work the next questions if they, they so choose. Uh, so, I want to start with we continue our plans for reopening with our principals and our directors of operations. There will be a K to five ad hoc committee meeting tomorrow to solidify plans for the April 12th reopening. Each Tuesday, there's been a countywide meeting with Dr. Mendoza and the superintendents from all sides of the county. At that meeting today, Dr. Mendoza shared that the community transmission rate is above 100 for 100,000 people on a seven day average. This transmission rate puts Monroe County School Districts in the red zone, according to CDC guidelines. As a result, Dr. Mendoza cannot support a reopening of secondary schools until this transmission rate is reduced. At this point, we continue to plan for reopening K-12 and will monitor the transmission rate. The CDC guidelines are more lenient for elementary schools due to the fact that students are with similar students each day. This is not the case with secondary students. Even at current transmission rates, we can reopen grades K through five on April 12th. We will have to see where transmission rates are at the break to determine if we can open 612 at that time. We are all disappointed we cannot be certain about the secondary return but we remain hopeful our numbers will reduce and we no longer are within the red zone restrictions. Well, I think given the issues of safety and the recommendations and guidelines that are coming from the health departments, if we were, if we were to come back, uh, I think we'd be remiss because we couldn't account for, we, we don't have anywhere to hang our head in terms of the safety of students uh, without county support, state support, or, or CDC support. If we can make the mistake and that with our plan, the president said we're going back to the one. The state, uh, we, can, we can put things out there, but again, the, I think the risk is if students get ill, if staff gets ill, if people in the community are ill, then 
were because we didn't honor the recommendations of uh, Dr. Mendoza. How much higher is the transmission rate than the than recommended? Do we know we have that number? The red zone. Yeah. How much? How much into the red zone are we right now? We well today's number was one twenty. What's the cutoff for the one hundred? Do we what? have to use the countywide data? I know that when we started doing, when the state started doing yellow zones and orange zones, we were talking about how oh, Gates was in one zone and Reese was in another zone and we stayed out of the zone. Is there any argument that we can do a more localized look at the data? We can look at the data. Right now, we're all in the red zone. Okay. County. County. This is not news I really relish. Can we look at whether Spencerport or yes, when Spencerport is in the county, the red zone. If this this week we're at one, you know, we're in the red zone this week. Is all that what is that when we're pooled with all the data in the county, or is that when we're looking at just the numbers from our communities from the Spencerport? Well, Dr. Mendoza shows the county map, right? And he has the boundaries of the school district. Okay. So that'll show the color, and we're red. Okay. Okay. So locally, the towns and counties in the such schools are red. Yes. Okay. That's all. Okay. Thank you. So just back to, to uh, the seventy point. You say we might not get support from Mendoza or CDC or whoever. What support do we get from them now that we wouldn't be getting if we were to go open? I mean, we're following the guidelines, the health guidelines. Right. Uh, I to do actually, that. New York State Department of Health is sort of silent right now. Okay. And Dr. Mendoza, I mentioned several other times about the Finger Lakes Task Force safety reopening. They couldn't come to an agreement. I'm recommending that we use CDC guidelines. But knowing the CDC guidelines, they came out and they made reductions to three feet if you weren't in a high transmission, the red zone. So we wouldn't be, uh, if we were open right now, we, would, we wouldn't be under CDC guidelines, we wouldn't be under New York State. Department of Health, the, the guidance is set like some time ago, and Dr. Mendoza doesn't support it. So we would be we'd be taking a stand that I think it's this is we would also make it's very susceptible to subsequent litigation while it's mm -hmm. against the district for any organizations who think you do what you were told and now something happened and now you're stuck. I can see the red side. I mean, I would also say that, you know, we're educators and we're not medical doctors. So even though we may have our own opinions, uh, I think without taking the advice of, of medical professionals, we're out there on a limb that is uh, a risky limb. And I know how desperately we want our children back to school. I know how excited we all were at the prospects. And I'm still hopeful uh, that these numbers will reduce, but I don't think we know. Do you know if he, if Dr. Mendoza is looking for the whole county number to come down? Or let's hypothetically say that our district went below that 100 would be if it's green like then? Yes. Okay. I mean, I would recommend that. Mm -hmm. And what basis would be would be the CDC. Right. So are there <clears throat> school districts in Monroe County that are not in the red? Not to my knowledge, no. So we're going to continue to proceed as if we are going to open on the 12th, that we would poison ready. We're going to wait and see what happens with the second. That's the plan. That's the plan. I mean, right now, uh, well, starting tomorrow, guests are going to start coming out of rooms and going into classrooms at Cosgrove. Okay. 
we're going to get the plant to bring it up back and ball. Julie's working on the busing routes. Busing routes are done for K5. Uh, so, uh, we're going to be able to do our April 12th plan regardless, right? Or, or is this putting our whole plan in jeopardy? K5. Yeah. We plan to. K5 is a well, K5, we still fall under CDC guidelines and we can do this safely. Okay. And we are postured to go 612 when we're not in the red zone. Okay, so, so what's in jeopardy right now is, is 612. 612. I, I just think that just because of what we've been living through the past several weeks, and of course, you know, cabinets and those. The community feeling just the way that the board does, but it is very important that we let people know exactly why we were under, are under the constraint. That's in clear and very plain language. No, you know, no, like oh, you know, this and this, and to the point of what we heard tonight. Uh, you know, if we don't follow these guidelines, this is what will happen to us. There's litigation implications that follows it. Oh, I just am very concerned about being very clear about how this is not in the hands of the community because we are going to get raked over the road. So I just want it to be out there and very clear and without any mixed language because it is, people won't understand unless they're very. So, Dr. Kissel, so Mendoza, I hear about this weekly rolling average term, right? So, he called red zone today. When does he readdress the color of the zones, the change to orange or yellow? Every every day, every week? No, once a week. Every it's week. a seven day rolling right. average. So, so, seven days from today ish, I guess. Right. So, you'll get more data on your meetings if you want to talk about Tuesday. Yes. Yeah. 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 And hopefully what we see in part of the spring break doesn't uh, uh to damage the short term open. Mm -hmm. You're just a messenger, Mr. Kissel. You're just a messenger. And, and we're also the messenger, and we're also getting um, a, a, a lot of feedback that, that we're doing something wrong. Uh, so yes, I, I I agree with Kate when we communicate this. Um, I, actually, there is no, no real change right now. If, if we were moving forward with a, a plan to figure out how we do uh, 612, there, there has not been any finalized plan. The survey has gone out. That survey really helps inform transportation. Do we know how many respondents we've had thus far? I, I don't have the results of that, that survey, but next board meeting will put that. Obviously, the whole situation. But, you know, <laughs> again, potentially perception is reality. We send out that, that survey, and people are like, oh, we're going back. They, they, they don't make the leap of this is informing of the potential. It's, I got this, and it's happening. So, you know, and that's. Many people on the board. And the timing of this yeah. just came out today. And that, that's difficult to hear because that's not what we want. Okay. You know, and as we know with this, that though we can only hope those numbers come down and it can change so quickly. So you know, I think we need to I think we need to remain hopeful that those numbers are going to go down. We continue to move forward like well, they are going to go down, down because if we get that quick. The numbers are down. We're ready. Well, we're then, not. We don't need another week or another two weeks. But then the question is: yeah. you go down, everybody moves, and then we go back. Yeah. Then what do we do? Right. Yeah. yeah. So is, is Mendoza going to make a, like a press conference and announce it to the community, or is it just relevant schools? That's I mean, serious. he's interviewed frequently. Yeah, yeah. this is pretty serious information. He should tell mm -hmm. what the community is saying, right? I think he's saying. He has a press secretary, but I mean, he, should, <laughs> he, should, he should tell somebody, you know. I think when I think the way it's set up, and I'm not saying it's the right way, 
and this is just my opinion. It seems when he talks to specific groups, he expects those groups to disseminate accordingly to whatever organization they oversee. So when he meets with the superintendents on Tuesdays, the information that he puts out there, he probably expects the superintendents to disperse that information accordingly. But then, Did they find out? I mean, for so long, mm -hmm. on the news on a daily basis of what happened on the average yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Right. And, and so this, this coming up, like out of nowhere. Is right. Oh, I know. Okay. I know. It's, it, it's, it's discouraging because, you know, we're ready to move forward. We've got some great plans in place. Those plans are going to continue to be worked down. We just need to be hopeful that we get in a situation where those numbers drop so that we can move forward. It's um, when this message came out to, to us this afternoon, it was frustrating. Yeah. Very, very frustrating. And I think it's for everybody sitting in this room. So, one more question just about numbers. That is, uh, so, we're at 120 out of 100,000. Is that where we are? That, that's bad, right? Yeah. It has to be under 100. And then there's a, a, a percent, one point something. What's the, the minimum growing average? Does anybody know what that number is? It's got to be the growing average of one point something. One point seven three. One point four. Yeah. So it has to be under that. I'm not sure it's true. No, the transmission rate is kind of like five. Yeah. Those are two different metrics. Oh. Two different things. Could I um, ask a broader question about the four days of sleep? Um, I know there's a goal right now, and there's somewhere else we're going for. Is there going to be a plan that we see an offer in the year of a potential of a five days, or is that not something that we would like to have? Right now, when we look at the number of elementary uh, reopening, the number of teachers that will be teaching in the classroom, uh, response to elementary teachers, right? They need that planning time. Yeah. If there came a point where they felt that they were ready to move, it's possible, but it's also not clear when that would happen. Okay. What about at the middle school and the high school? Let's assume that we are able to get to that four days. Would they look at five years? Yeah. What would be the hurdle there? I think it's yet another ship. And we have to look at what the implications are for the teachers in terms of the specials and different things in the schools that they do on given days, including Wednesdays. It's just, and from my perspective, just kind of looking at that, there's like eight, eight to nine weeks from April 12th to when class is really extremely to get this going, I mean, do you do four weeks ready, you do another shift and right. another change and try to get the teachers and the kids and the parents and everybody else on board with another shift four or five weeks down the road for purposes of four or five weeks? So to me, I would say that that's, our planning should be for the fall and how our schools are on what are open five days a week in the fall. Let's get as many days in for the rest of this year as we can. Right. And start going from there. It's funny. So, the four days is a very non traditional model for putting it all, all, all hands on deck those four days. That's why it's a four day. We go to fifth, I, I need to get that day of Wednesday to kind of jump back kind of talk and just kind of make, you know, make adjustments and stuff. So, and to go to fifth day, it would be so difficult. Yeah. Yeah. You've got teachers that are already teaching yeah. that don't normally teach a class, they yeah. teach RTI and those kinds of things. So this is all kind of a new thing for them to do. As far as the, you know, the, especially the high school, there are cases where we have kids in high school who are watching right. the younger kids, yeah. you know, and their, their schedules meshing and they all work. So if we send the high school kids about five days, but no more than four, then you're throwing that piece into the work. Yeah, I understand. I just, you know, if anything, Period of time, it's not all of us, it's that every single person in our day is. Yeah. 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 Yeah
They're doing it Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. They only need a date Wednesday to, to housing, but they're doing it for they should be able to I don't know say. The issue but, really is back to the teachers that haven't been. Mm -hmm. We have remote teachers. Uh -huh. We have teachers that are going to be in classrooms that fire that wasn't their responsibility. And we have the classroom teachers and they they need time to orient. They need yeah. time to coordinate the curriculum that they're teaching. Yeah. Uh, and back to how we got where we are, the ad hoc committee was administrative teachers asked to review how could we increase the amount of in-person learning time for students. And I wanted the teachers and administrators who make this happen to present a recommendation. And so in looking at all the issues, which are many, and they vary by school as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so in some cases, uh, for example, you know, the teaching of specials and so forth, they need those teachers at different times. And it's very complex uh, yeah. at each different school. I think this will just be another area where we need clear communication to the community because there's going to be a lot of questions. And as other districts start to open five days a week, there's going to be a lot of questions as to why that support can't or didn't. So making sure that everybody in the community understands what they're doing. Yes. You know, going to two to four, it's a big ask to have you left it. It's great. It is. And I know that fifth day is you need it. I understand that. You know, I know that. Right? And some people don't know that. That's where you know not you both say the team members. No, not you, I meant the team members. <laughs> Um, they don't know that. So, I don't know. Yeah. So, you were prompting the question, not challenging it, but just to get it out. And yeah, you know, I mean, let's always point. We haven't said, well, if you're going forward, it's still fine. I'm just thinking for a three members. If you can do it more times tomorrow, well, I'm fine. To your point, Dave, and one of the ways that I got dragged my head around it is for every kid that's doing this, there's another kid that's doing that. We have kids that are running in remote that we need to administrate equitable education. And that was the best way that I could explain to anyone who was me why we're going on that. Because there still needs to be equity in the learning. And it's something that it used to be all kids in school all the time. And now we have to have this remote option that we're some of the work. So I mean we are still supporting two learning models. Yeah, I, 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 I don't have the last thing. Yeah. <clears throat> the other thing to Dr. Kissel's point, she talked about how the dynamic of each building is, is different, and that really puts a lot of stress on the system. It's even deeper than that, it's even different at grade levels. Mm -hmm. It's so it, you know, one building may have these issues, but it also gets down to the enrollment of each grade level as well, which makes this tricky. And with the scheduling, um, and, and also the the whole thing about RTI teachers, because we have to regroup classrooms. The RTI RTI teachers teaching in the classroom that that's an astronomical shift for those teachers. And teacher leaders are involved in that. I know that not just teacher leaders, but teachers on all the teams are providing support to those RTI teachers. So. When kids come back four days, they're getting a quality education. They're not just coming in and being supervised. They're being taught quality education opportunities and not just being supervised. That's a huge tip. So that concludes the superintendent's presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I think you started. I think you started. I played well, left. Yeah. I think well, the yeah, yeah. report on case on, on opening. opening, yes. Yeah. Now we go to uh, budget <laughs> update. Yeah. Oh, man, I got out. Oh, that's right. Any questions? Yeah. You're writing a tough budget. You guys need to stand up, get some energy uh, going. Uh, we stand up, we're walking out the door. <laughs> okay, so. Um, we're going to do the second part of the expenditure side. We're going to talk about the instruction and what they call undistributed, which um, you'll see later on is benefits, 
debt service and interfund transfers. And then we're going to wrap it up. And I'm just going to share with you sort of where we're at uh, today. So just remember, I'm going to give you a big picture. Uh, don't plan to get into the, the weeds for the most part, but for instruction, there's four major functional categories. You can see administration improvement, teaching, instructional media, people services. Within each one of those four major categories, there's sub functions, which essentially are different departments. The instruction budget overall is close to 50% of our overall budget. You can see that right now, uh, we're looking at a $1.1 million increase, uh, just under 2.6%. So we're gonna take a little bit of look uh, at each one of these um, four major components. So the first, is administration and improvement. Uh, it covers four different uh, functional areas. Uh, the curriculum and super uh, development and supervision, that's the super, uh, assistant superintendent for instructions office. Uh, the increase there is uh, meaning salary. The 2020, the supervision regular is uh, comprises most of the building level administrators. Uh, again, the increase there is based on um, salaries. Uh, we do have two retirements in there, so you're seeing uh, somewhat of a, a decrease. The 2060 is research planning and evaluation. That's an area that Tim oversees. Um, again, slight increase due to salaries and OC service. And the 2070 is professional development. Uh, even though there's an increase in BOCES services, uh, we did have a retirement. Uh, our PD director retired uh, at this point in time. That position is not being replaced. Uh, Ty is being very creative and looking at different ways to offer that. We're going to look at using the federal funds uh, to help do that. So overall, you're actually seeing a decrease uh, in this particular um, major functional area. Any questions on administration and improvement? All right, moving to teaching. Here, take a look at the 2281st. OCED, really CTE, Career and Technical Education. That number is provided to us by BOCES based on enrollment in December. Teaching special schools, that's community education. You're seeing an increase there as I look at trend line data. Uh, we're offering more courses. Uh, so the salary line went up a little bit. Um, so that's why you're seeing a slight increase there. Let's talk a little bit about uh, what they call teaching regular. Now, again, I don't create these titles. So um, I combined the, the 15 instructional areas. So that covers the pre-K through 12 teachers. It also covers teaching assistants. Um, and you're seeing a slight, Corey, you mind moving the picture there so I can see a little bit better. Thank you. Um, again, a slight increase. The um, instructional, the, the, the non-instructional salaries, again, uh, we, we've had um, some retirement, but the larger decrease there is actually not going to stay. Uh, it's something that as I wrap and review for these presentations, I find some things that we can, we should add, some things that we delete. Uh, that's not including uh, some of the expenses for our summer school programs. So that number is going to change, uh, as are many of these. Um, equipment, now that number is going to go down. Uh, again, uh, so that will probably be flat. Um, you know, the rest are, are small changes overall. BOCE services, again, as I look at what was causing that uh, increase, um, strangely enough, it was for e-learning. So uh, not a surprise. Uh, so again, overall $390,000 or 1.72%. Any questions specific to teaching regular? Dave? This may not be your... Uh... I don't know what time you showed us the cost of testing for the huge number. Is that coming up in the presentation? So the cost of testing is within the 2060 code okay. and it's through BOCES, okay. a BOCES line. Okay. Now, did you go over go that or you haven't done that? Well, I didn't talk specifically. You want 500,000 foot. foot. You're at about 100 foot. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I can certainly address it or, or tie can certainly no, my address it was, as well. It, my, my, my thought was they never had, had, had to go down, right? No. It generally, the, the testing is on the street. Well, in, in the current year, yes. Okay, yeah. It's, it's placed in the budget. 
based on the all of our students participating. Right. Right. So, correct. And then any funds that are not used based on participation rate, then ultimately go back to zero. But last year we did test though, right? Right. Right. So did we still spend the money or no? No, it rolled into fund balance. Got it. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, so the next uh, specific area I wanted to really talk about was students with disabilities. Uh, again, you know, I, I can share with you, you know, what's happening, but really the, the number you really need to, to look at is, is what's happening at, at BOCI services. Um, of a $537,000 increase, uh, 409 of that uh, is related to BOCI services within this particular area. I can share with you, um, Ty obviously has conversations with Andrea uh, about this budget. I have conversations with Andrea. Uh, and what's occurring is we've had students who move in who require some very specialized services uh, that we can't provide. We have to go through BOCES. Uh, sometimes you have to go through a private school to address those needs. And, and that's what we do. Um, on the flip side, we usually get some revenue called excess cost aid. But remember, we'll get that in 22-23 because you get it in the following year. So that's really what's driving that increase. Big number, big change, Dave. I'm sorry. What kind of services are we going to post that we can't provide the for? For example, what are we asking them to do? Like BHOT, ASD stuff, or no? I tell you, on a, I mean, really, they're the yeah. medical services. Yes, all okay. medical, like one on one help aid, yeah. you know, help nurse, nurse right? Yep. Yeah. 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 Medi medically fragile. Is sure. Yeah. yeah. Specific. I don't know, Dave. I would defer to Andrew, right? Right. it's medi medically fragile. Right. Yeah. Let's take what you just proposed and just amp it up. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to go to instructional media next. Two functional codes, uh, in, uh, library and, and computer-assisted instruction, not a large increase. I will share the 2630. Um, Corey does a phenomenal job of managing that, and managing the finances and constant communication with both Ty and myself. But this is an area that we really have to focus on because it's part of that one-to-one -one initiative. How do we best use those fundings, go through BOCES to get the aid in the following year? How do we use our, uh, what we call SSIP or Smart School Investment Plan um, to, to maximize and plan that out, uh, especially now? So Rick, what are some examples of what's in the school library and AV? Salaries, uh, library textbooks, um, and materials and supplies. Really, that's it, part of that is, is per pupil. The majority of that increase um, is change in salary. But I know that many of the uh, elementary principals, in particular, as part of their per pupil, are trying to address um, the library needs, uh, furniture wise, carpet, you know, just make it more dynamic and more useful. Okay. Pupil services, again, quite a few different uh, functional areas. Uh, you can see, you know, for a lot of this really is, is salary related. Um, I just want to highlight, you're probably seeing, you know, budget to budget, such a huge increase. Remember that in the current budget, I made adjustments because of the re new reporting requirements for the uh, financial transparency. That's why you're seeing it. So I've taken um, psychology, uh, psychological, Psychologists, social workers, I've taken some of that out of the students with special needs budget. So that's why you're seeing that increase. I also want to highlight um, in the 2815, uh, we went, we had a um, uh, medical director that we were contracting with. Um, we did not do that in the current year. We hired our own, Danielle Adam. And I actually think that that was probably one of the smartest moves we've made uh, right now, is she's helped us navigate and been very instrumental in moving us forward and helping us make certain decisions. Any questions to the pupil services? As it relates to athletics, uh, a lot of that is just based on contractual expenses. Uh, Section five has certain contracts with um, officials. It's our uh, rental space for hockey, lacrosse, baseball, those type things. Uh, so not a lot within our control there. your call last time, uh, sometimes I like to share with you, this is overall the instruction, but it's based by object code. So again, you can just get a better sense. 
you can see, you know, close to 455,000 is based on salaries. Uh, we've had movement within what they call, I call these 471 codes. So you have parentally placed students, and that's difficult because what happens is if the parent doesn't register with the district, and then they have particular um, needs, they will then that district will then they're required to provide a service. They'll then build the district, the home district, or district of residence. Um, a lot of times there's a lack of communication between each district. So as a matter of fact, uh, working with Andrea now, they had a couple, uh, two children that we did not know about that required some services, which is increasing our budget that we didn't budget for. Uh, so we're trying to, these numbers will probably change uh, again as I, as I get more information. And then obviously policy services. We talked about uh, the students with disabilities, uh, 400 and, uh, plus thousand, and then all the normal uh, smaller increases within policies. So any questions as it relates to any additional questions on overall instruction? Instructional salaries, is that include your entire benefit package or is that just salary? That's a great lead in Mike to <laughs> undistributed. And I didn't even ask you to do that. So okay, so they call it undistributed. It covers employee benefits, which has obviously you can see a multitude of different um, functional areas, your debt service and your interfund transfers. So let's talk a little bit about debt service. With the 2018 project coming to a close for the most part, uh, we're going out with permanent financing. You can see that that's a, an increase of 780,000. Uh, I've been working closely with our financial advisor to make sure that as we roll out this number, how does that impact A in the future years? More importantly, how does that impact our tax cap exclusion? In other words, trying to keep this at a level amount so that we're not seeing that huge dip uh, on the exclusion to help with our property tax levy. Interfund transfers, again, there are certain programs that uh, are offered that the uh, uh, general fund is required to pay 20%. It's relatively small. But let's talk a little bit about employee benefits. So the pension system, uh, both for the state retirement or ERS, the uh, teacher's retirement system, again, it's not just teachers, it's any certificated staff. So that's many of the uh, administrators out there who are what they call certificated. I just wanted to share with you, you can see to the left, those are the, what they call the employer contribution rate. So again, we're somewhat dependent upon what those percentages are. It all is based on the market um, for both of those systems. And then this is just the chart showing sort of what's happened uh, historically um, as the expenses. And you, just sort of, you can sort of see you know, that that yo-yo effect um, on the TRS. ERS, again, is a number that's provided by ERS. They do a phenomenal job of projecting out what the future will be. I use that number. Um, any questions on the pension system itself? Okay. Oops. Okay, so um, the other part of the big piece of overall undistributed is uh, benefits, and, and that's, um, medical health insurance. Again, you can see 1.1 million or 8%. I'm using anywhere from 8.5% to 12% for the potential premium increase. Um, what I did want to share with you is if, if you look to the left, this, this is the 90-60 code overall. You can see that as a percentage of budget, our expenditures continually increase. So, what, so obviously, what does that mean? It means that health insurance is taking up more of our budget that we need to account for. On the right-hand side, the Rash One and Medicare Blue Choice, those are programs specific for our retirees. Jimmy can probably give you a lot more detail if you want it. Um, but what I'm trying to sh share here is, again, is this overall benefits health insurance is taking up part of our budget. These two particular uh, plans are driving a lot of that increase. So you can see the um, Blue Choice or the Medicare Blue Choice in 1516 was 748,000. It's now up to 1.1 million and um, 924 for the RASH plan up to 1.3. The RASH plan is, we are part of that consortium. Uh, I'm on the board. I actually think we do a pretty good job looking at what type of fund balance and managing um, that. And that's why you're not seeing as large an increase. The um, 
Medicare Blue Choice is more of an Excellus product. Uh, we don't really dictate um, or have much say into what those premium increases would be pretty much spot on, Kim. Yep. So again, I just wanted to share some historical uh, information to share with you what's happening, because obviously this is a big part of the budget. It's usually a larger increase year over year. Um, any questions on? So, no? so the, uh, the table in the bottom right. Um, this? Yeah, so, so is, is that a function of, of the change in cost or is it also uh, the change in number of people that are enrolled in each program? Yes. <laughs> it's both. I mean, obviously, is, 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 is there a substantial change? I know we've been trying to um, add in things like the high deductible plans. Is, is, is that a part of this factor? I would say no, but I'm going to defer to Jamie. She's much more familiar. In, well, I think uh, when you're plans. taking a look at the chart here on the right, we're taking a look at this and the Rash one and the blue choice. So these are our retiree okay, premiums. Right, okay, right. So then, you know, we benefit from the consortium for our Rash two because the rate is based upon the Monroe County school districts versus the community. When you take a look at our over 65 plants, those are community rated. Therefore, we're experiencing higher increases. And so you're seeing that growing much higher than you're seeing the Rash two plans. Yes, yeah, so the Current employees in the rash are the option for rash two. Correct. And the retirees Correct. Are the employee plans, are they high deductible plans or are they? We do have high, we do have the high deductible plan for active employees. Okay. We do. For all of them or do they choose? As an option. As an option for all of our groups. Yep, it's always been an option since um, it was rolled out from the rash consortium. Any additional questions? All right, so let's get to the big picture. Revenue I shared with you in prior meetings is about 84.3 as of today. Shared with you last meeting, the general support and transportation pieces, just reviewed the instruction and undistributed so that right now within our budget, and I know this is gonna change based on, again, what I shared earlier as I prep for each of these, I see things that need to be added, I see things that need to be removed. But right now, our, uh, expenditures exceed our revenues of 3.5 million. If we were to continue to do what we've done in the past, which is to use our different reserves to help balance our budget, you'd see that we use about 2.2. So we're still looking at some sort of deficit in the area of about 1.2 million. So how do we begin to address that? I go back and I'll look at uh, revenues. So as an example, uh, local sources, sales tax. We're gonna see a little bit later tonight even. Our uh, first payment for sales tax was higher than what we had anticipated. Our second payment was lower. I'm still projecting it will have some surplus. Is that an area that I may feel we may go to move a little bit? Um, state aid, hopefully the governor, you know, legislature, uh, approve the state budget April 1, um, which again is, is critical. Many, many, many years ago, they wouldn't approve it until August. So many districts would go into line with what their actual aid would be. This governor uh, has done, I think, a phenomenal job of getting on time state budgets. The federal stimulus. So you heard earlier this evening about the potential 12.4 billion in the American Rescue Plan. Um, remember that that's not additional money to districts. So again, in the current year budget, they had what they call the first federal stimulus, the Federal CARES Act. The governor pulled out about 611,000 and then he supplanted it with that federal stimulus. In the current 84.3 million, he's removed 3.4 million of our state aid and supplanted it with the second, the CCRSA federal stimulus. Right now, although I don't have any particulars, we're looking at a little under 3.8 million that's been distributed to Spencerport. Uh, again, I don't know if that's going to be allowed to use over multiple years. Um, most likely it's going to be tied to specific expenses. I really don't have any details. That's why it's so critical that uh, they approve a budget by April 1. Uh, 
it will have a lot more um, decision uh, making um, if we have that information. So let me just be clear uh, if history is any teacher, there's going to be strings attached. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, when it, as that information comes out, I, I've already had conversations with Dr. Timms, who uh, works with me on our long-range financial analysis. So there's certain strategies. So if that is the case, you don't look at something that's going to have a legacy cost. You look at something that's going to allow you to have a one-time purchase, so you're not having to incur that multiple years out. Those are the type of things that we're going to be looking at. But that, that 3.8 you said, mm -hmm. um, that can very well end up being substituted like they did the last one, correct? Mm -hmm. so, so we could end up with zero net change if just, okay, we're going to call it something different and it's going to come from this checkbook. Yeah, th there's so it could be zero change to our budget. Right. Th there's so many unknowns at this stage. I, I raise it just from a transparency perspective that that's what I'm seeing. Um, I'm sure you guys have read in, in you know, NISBA, you know, the things we've attended. This year may not be the, a particular problem, although I think it is. Um, it's years two, three, and potentially more. So what happens when the state doesn't have that federal stimulus money coming in? Is the state going to have that money? That's the issue. From an expenditure perspective, um, just to reiterate, so the initial CARES Act, the amount that we received in stimulus was subtracted by the amount um, the state gave us our net, our net with the zero. Correct. Same with, as of this point, for the second stimulus. There seems to be a general perception in society regard to uh, stimulus money in general, but there's an organization that pulls out side government organizations in the private sector. This is just the free money that was going to catch the mutuality between the two unions. It really wasn't like that the first time around for us. Nope. And we got to wait and see. Yep. Thank you. Yep. So on the expenditure side, again, I've already reached out to um, many of the directors. We're going to be looking at equipment. Typically, we look at this. We try to do some things. Can we maybe pre-buy to help offset some of that? Um, if I pre-buy, that means less fund balance in the current year. Um, but those are things obviously that we need. Um, contractually, um, you know, we build within Nelson's budget sort of these mini projects uh, to address some of those building condition survey comments that come in. Uh, we normally remove those. Um, continue to look at staffing. Um, Continue to look at enrollment, uh, look at the retirements. A lot of those retirements are already in the number that I shared, the 87. Um, you know, do we look at replacing or, or how do we, we do that? You know, Jamie and I are uh, going to be working with um, middle and high school in the coming days um, to finalize some of that information. And ultimately, just to follow up with Jamie real fast, there was rumors that there was going to be a New York State TRS. Uh, it's been a contract it's January 31st. Okay, so that is. I have seen still some conversation mm -hmm. about that. There potentially two, but again, don't know enough details. Sometimes districts have to buy into it. And if you buy into it, you, you may not be breaking even. So it's a TBD, but for the most part, to Jamie's point, we've not heard anything substantial or concrete. The last, so the last, I, the last I read on that from Saney's, the School Administrators Association, um, their take on it was it's not favorable. Oh, okay. Okay. So you're probably not going to see anything come through with that. They gave two an A and a B. Mm -hmm. And they said the first option is how they have to second one was a possibility. Right. But they have their eye on it. I thought I read the same thing. Yeah, it's, it doesn't look good. Yeah. Lastly, how do we use our fund balance and reserves? Um, you know, this, I'm going to share with you, I, I get more and more nervous um, as we have to begin to use this. Because if I can't, if we don't generate, if we don't have savings on the expense side, or if um, I'm spot on on the revenue side, which quite honestly, when you look at state aid, I am. Um, I can't reproduce that, which just then decreases the reserves. 
So we really need to do some, some long range planning to, to help address um, our reliance on those reserves. So that's big picture. Uh, we have still a lot of work to do uh, from now until when we come back on April 13th. But I hope some of the pieces of the puzzle will be um, more complete, specifically the, uh, the state aid. Dave? Yeah, just one comment, and this is not a question, I don't want to answer, but that last comment you made about the, the, the uh, reserves, I always go, it's not good. It's going to bite us in the future. I've been there for seven years, right? You know, so I don't know when we as a group say, we just shouldn't do that anymore. You know, I mean, and it's like using money out of your grandpa's mattress. You fall short, you take 50. Next year, you take 60. And it's always there. So, we, I, in my opinion, I don't think of balancing the budget when you have a blank check from someone with the reserve funds to, to make up the grade. So, you know, referencing uh, Rick Kim's presentation and all of these, and that last comment that, that you make, and I'm you know, just saying, you always go, but we always they can do it, you know? So, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, I look, yeah. But to be fair, Rick is incredibly accurate. We've always been able to put back in this country in order to get money. Whatever we allocated from the reserves to the budget for the year, we always been able to put back that number and put it right back in the same year. So, in the last six years that I've been here, we've never been a net negative. Uh, those are that wasn't really the capital budget. But they're not growing, they're not really growing though either. Yeah, I mean, they got 20, put 20 back in, you're flat. Yeah, no, I agree. No, I agree. Yeah, yeah. You're saying it's, it, it's not good, but it's almost it's not as bleak, quite as bleak as it looks up there. Like, like, the brick is still good. Yeah. I mean, but, I mean, I mean honestly, I, I think we only go out with a 100% balanced budget, but. I mean, we're, we're using it the way they should be used. Right. Um, but. I think overall to your point, I know you weren't looking for a comment, but yeah, no. um, if, if you go back and look, um, we're not generating a lot of surplus year over year, which in large part will come back. So I've heard loud and clear about the board's thought process on a capital project. Because we're not generating that large surplus, we're not able to put that money into the reserve for capital projects, which ultimately, um, at some point when we bring forward to you uh, sort of our plan, uh, we may be looking at um, doing something that the community is not used to, and that is actually having some sort of tax rate increase uh, to, to move forward in the capital project. So it's just some long-term planning, but again, um, trust me, Dr. Timms has um, shared that quite often. All right. Any questions? <laughs> All right. Thanks, Greg. So we're feeling a little financial work yeah. on the heels of your. So, big picture. Um, you know, it's interesting. I've looked at the projections that I did for revenue and expense over the last couple months, and they've been all over the map. I think it just goes to show, you know, if you do this too early, uh, there's so many unknowns. Um, right now, because of the 20% increase, or the 20% that was withheld, that we believe we're going to now receive, uh, we've had uh, some good news. Um, we have some surplus in the, the pilot uh, amount, and I made an increase for sales tax. Um, aggressive from my perspective, but hopefully that's where we'll end up. Uh, we're going to be better off on the revenue side. On the expenditures, I got to tell you, I've been kind of making an assumption about one thing. You know, you guys are talking you know, to reopen. I made certain assumptions based on, you know, one reopening. Now, if we move forward with something else, that's going to change these numbers. So take it with a grain of salt. I am projecting uh, on balance of about 270000 out of an $84 million budget. That's not a lot, but it's better than where I, where I shared with you last month. Any questions on the general fund side? 
I know I'm just bothering you guy. Okay, school lunch. So again, um, trying to compare apples to apples is very difficult with this. Uh, truth of the matter is, um, you know, you're going to be losing money. But again, as hard as Gary works on um, managing expenses, as hard as as we work on trying to increase um, you know, sales, uh, it's just difficult to do. I did ask Gary sort of help me, you know, with the number of meals sold. Sometimes I think that's easier to, to comprehend. So um, last year, from the beginning of the year until March 20th, um, we sold uh, 56,056 breakfasts and um, 160,000 lunch. Uh, today, this year, the good news for breakfast, uh, 56,307. Uh, the not so good news is we sold 95,000 and not sold, but oh, wow. distributed. Um, in talking to Gary, although that's not really, it, it's more than what you need to hope for, uh, considering, you know, there's no kids in school online, but so you want that. Um, and trying to get kids uh, to come through um, to the remote uh, is difficult at best. So, the numbers are with that. But hopefully, that provides a little bit more context for you. Can I leave it at that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Financial report. Ms. Kelly and Gary Durkin, all in favor? Seven no. Any evaluation? How much concerns? I just think I'll go up my mask and I wouldn't feel like it was. It's a win. Okay. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> we can't talk that. Okay. So at 7 52, we're going to move into executive session. Oh, I need a motion. For the purpose of discussing negotiations with the collective bargaining unit and the employment history of the Second. Eight, all in favor? Aye. 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 I make a motion to include the employment matter that was discussed during the first discussion. Second. Second. Eight. All in favor? Seven. No. I make a motion to amend. Motion to amend. Second. Second. Gary. All in favor? Seven. No. Thank you all that stayed online.